Okay, so they've been at this CRT crap for years, man. At least decades. Okay, this is University of Oregon. Oh, yeah, by the way, subscribe star.com slash thirst worst, bitch. Oh, what a delightful expenditure of resources. Here to really get us to start thinking about how in Hollywood film and other types of visual culture, but, um, you know, uh, Hollywood films in particular, racial representation has been organized according to these poles of whiteness and non-whiteness. So um, primarily uh, whiteness and blackness. And this hierarchy of representation is so ingrained that whiteness tends to focus to, to be a sort of neutral or non-race default in terms of representation. Okay, so first of all, like I said before, like, is this a really awesome expenditure of resources or what? Uh, you know, allowing some woman to pontificate about, you know, racial representation in media and Hollywood media. So what? I mean, so she gets to teach other young starry-eyed pupils how to teach people how to teach people about representation and media. So it's just like one big college collegiate pyramid scheme. Uh, that's number one. But then she frames, I love the framing, uh, whiteness is a non-racialized default. I mean, she, is she framing that as like, she's framing that as like a form of white privilege, right? Like that white people in media are just sort of a, a neutral raceless default. I don't think that's a bonus, dude. I don't think that's a boon. I think that's like, uh, isn't there a term for that? Deracination? Isn't that being stripped of one's identity, in a sense? Uh, let's see what else she's got to say. And uh, I'd like to actually Maybe quote get into a it. media studies scholar named Richard Dyer, whose uh, name I'll definitely add to the bibliography. Uh, he has a book entitled White, where he really critiques right. rep white representation in media studies. Uh, white representation is always negative. It, <laughs> I don't know where these CRT theorists get off on... Okay, it's a white. White is neutral. It's the default. It's did, they don't. They couldn't possibly think that white representation in media is positive or po you know positively reaffirming. They can't possibly believe that. There's no possible way. Um, <laughs> I just saw the guy who played uh, Artie from that '90s show Pete and Pete. He was in the Halloween requel, reboot, whatever. He's portrayed as the most idiotic, useless, like Homer Simpson-esque character ever. It was just one, like, contemporary example of many. Like, every reboot, requel, uh, you know, whatever. Like, uh, at this point, like, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is probably going on. And still, still going on. All those movies have some woke agenda that portrays white dudes as useless or villains or stupid or to be undercut or undermined. Uh, she addressed that. Uh. And he, he says, at the level of racial representation, whites are not of a certain race. They're just the human race. <laughs> so that was one of the things what? I wanted to sort of put out there and get us to think about how, um, in terms of representation, we tend to think about raced bodies as those bodies which are not white, right? So we think of raced bodies as black bodies or brown bodies or Asian bodies, but we tend to not really think black about bodies. Uh, what bodies sort of represent humanity or humanness, right? The bodies talk. Have you noticed that when listening to lefties? You know, this has been going on for, you know, roughly the, what, do, what would you call this, the early 20 teens? Yeah, so a lot of people notice that this, like, uber lefty crap these critical race theorists, critical gender theorists started to come out of the woodwork like around the tail end of Obama, right? So, yeah, this is about there. Um, but they started coming out with this language about bodies, black bodies, you know, trans bodies, uh, fat bodies, <laughs> whatever. Like, I think that's meant to invoke sort of an image of, like a mental image in the listener's head of like a, honestly, like a dead body, right? Because it's like right, right, right here is like right before... You know, uh, BLM is coming to the fore. Uh, a lot of these radical people are starting to get a foothold in universities, and BLM is just around the corner, right? They want you to think of a like a dead black person, right? When they say black bodies, that's what they want you to think of, so that you are more probably so that you're more sympathetic to their cause, so that you're more like, you know, snapping to attention to 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 aid them to be their ally because you think that it's really dire, right? I think that's very deliberate when they say bodies. We'll see. We'll have to count how many times they say buyer. This person says bodies during this fucking uh, clip here. Um, so, 
for me, I find it uh, really interesting that white performers, and we could think about you know any number of stars, white uh, white stars, white bodies. Uh, they've had the privilege of representing humanity and have traditionally assumed the central narrative position in Hollywood films. So we could think about somebody like uh, Meg Ryan or Tom Hanks, and think about the kinds of roles that are available to them, uh, the sort of uh, massive amounts of roles that could potentially be available to them, and then think about do we have the same level of stardom for non-white performers? Do we have the same level of starting for somebody yes. like uh, Tate Diggs or um, Will Smith is a you know one of the few black stars that we could point to that has the same caliber of career but I think we'd ha be hard pressed to think of for example um, many Latino or Latina stars in the way that we could have a Meg Ryan or a Tom Hanks so what and I think we'd be even more hard pressed to think of whether or not there are Native American stars at this point or Pacific Islander stars right so, yeah but so what I mean there are there are also a disproportionate amount of non-white stars um everybody knows that and not even whatever not even stars just like people working in the industry because these lefties don't know what the word disproportionate means um they a lot of times they conflate or blur the lines between the word majority and disproportionate they think that majority and disproportionate are the same thing or they just don't care because they're stupid and liars but <laughs> no i mean if you look at entertainment media it's it's disproportionately quote unquote of color so that's just absurd so, even back um, then the that was that was absurd the challenge for us here is to really learn how to discuss how the representation of a group in that has in our society served as something of an invisible default and how these representations um, from the beginning of cinema to the present have really had this central position and how all these other uh, racial representations have been organized around that and how do we begin it's, to it's not a bonus a though that has had the privilege of presenting itself as simply human Right. What does that mean? And what does that mean for us? Uh, uh it's not simply human. It's just like the, it's the default because it, it we're, you know, whites are the majority, or at least, well, back then they were, this is like, what, 11, 12 years ago this was filmed. So, you know, even more of a majority back then, but a super majority, like 20, 30 years prior to that, even um, to be human. No, it's just the, the majority. Like, and these people just have a problem with majority white. That's ultimately what they got a problem with. They got a problem with the white neutral default, even though that's already whites having their, uh, identity taken away from them and being deracinated. Like I said before, like whites will refer to themselves as a mutt. I can't, I can't believe that. Like, you know how a like, white person would be like, yeah, I'm Italian and Irish and English and whatever. I'm a mutt. It's like, damn, dude. <laughs> that just sounds self-deprecating. So, like, yeah, raceless, uh, race-neutral default. That doesn't sound awesome, uh, dude. But she's, she's acting like, yeah, you get to be a human being. It's like, really? I'm a mutt. <laughs> I don't know, dude. I, I, I'm, I'm thought of as a mutt, a European mutt. Uh, I don't think of myself that way. I never have. But um, I, re I remember that becoming common vernacular amongst white people in particular. Consumers of media, right, as people who take pleasure in these, uh, in these moments of escape, right, with uh, mainstream Hollywood films. And what does that mean for us, uh, not only as people seeking entertainment, but also as us here studying um, these images critically? So um, just to kind of give us a, an example of something that we could maybe build from, and I do want to be sh brief because I want to have time for us to discuss these issues maybe at the end. Brief, um, me if you're going forever, so Toots. for example, romantic comedy as a genre, right? Uh, I, I tend, I love romantic comedies. You know, we could pick any genre. Do you really? For a second. So, um, do you think she really loves romantic comedies or whatever the way, or Marvel movies or, or anything? You know, kind of like the way Arnita Sarkeesian, oh yeah, she's totally a gamer or whatever. I know that that's a stupid old school reference, but hey, look at what era we're in. <laughs> Looking, I just want to, I mean, I think it's important to point out like all the different instances throughout history of this being promoted. And, like, I didn't, you know, there you go. This They've been at this forever, but this is just like, oh yeah, oh, I, like you, love romantic comedies and Marvel movies and video games. No, 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 no. They're just grifting. Uh, you know, this genre tends to find humor in how male and female characters try to hold the upper hand in a relationship, right? So it's a sort of battle of power. Is Meg Ryan going to win or is Tom Hanks going to win? We don't really know. Evil. But that's just um, evil, man. And when we think about these films, and to use as two stars as an example, we could think about You've Got Mail, right? 
And when we think of yeah. that film, we could identify it as a romantic comedy. I'm going to go see the new romantic comedy, um, you know, You've Got Mail. But we would never really say, I'm going to go see the new white romantic comedy, You've Got Mail, right? It's sort of implicit in the description romantic comedy. Whereas if we were to say, and? for example, go see um, a film like Two Can Play That Game, which is also a romantic comedy, but uh, stars two African-American leads, uh, Vivica Fox and Morris Chestnut, we might qualify that film as we're going to go, I'm going to go see the new black romantic comedy, right? And so I just want to think about how, um, you know, those sort of qualifications really change the way that we think about uh, human, human beings and human representation on screen. You could think about another example, right? So, so okay, so I, I'm, what are we supposed to think about then? Do you have never noticed that they're always like we have to have these conversations and we have to like change the dialogue and really think about and but they never actually specify what we're thinking about like is the implication that we're thinking about okay like what what I'm led to be, what to think what I'm taking away from this as the listener is um, to not be racialized in media is some sort of privilege like I was saying before. Um, to be the non-racialized default in a, in a Hollywood scene or whatever, in music, Hollywood films, whatever it is, that's to be good. Uh, that's to be an advantage. I'm not so convinced. Um, I think that being the default villain or like the default guy who doesn't get it or the dopey, clumsy... Uh, Homer Simpson type character or whatever. And, 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 and on top of that, she said, oh, we're not going to say that we're going to see a white romantic comedy. I mean, hey, dude, this is white boy summer. <laughs> we should be saying that. Hey, I'm going to see a fucking, this is the whitest movie. This is the whitest band. I'm going to see that shit because like that would be great, wouldn't it? If people were saying that more or at least it would at least throw a fucking wrench into the whole lefty uh, CRT psycho system at the very least. So the framing here is very bizarre. It's very backwards. It's like, oh, yeah, whites. This is a form of the implication that I'm getting, you know, having been, been into this for a while, is that uh, the heavy implication that we're meant to come away with is that it's a form of white privilege to uh, not be racialized. So right. um, see if she's Spawn, right? For those of you that are more into the superhero flicks, right? It's the, it's the a black superhero as opposed to Batman, who's just a superhero period. period. Um, and That's these examples <laughs> are, you know, we could think of many different ones, right? But I think that these uh, very briefly illustrate the Hollywood assumption that all viewers have, um, that which is whatever their racial identification, that we should all be able to identify with white characters, right, on screen. But the reverse is seldom true. So if we hmm. see a film with black bodies in the central narrative black position, bodies. we might, or at least Hollywood's tendency is to perceive that as a film about black people, right? And not something that we could all tap into as a culture, as a nation. Um, and so unless a film makes a point of identifying or overemphasizing whiteness, its dominance and its centrality is really taken for granted. Uh, and for me, I think that that's a really fascinating it's not dominance. To start a discussion about the, the, the omnipresence of whiteness in, in our culture, right? Something as, um, as permeable as something that impacts us every day, which is media culture, right? And this, this is not just about the Hollywood screen. This is also about tabloid representations, which sort of take those Hollywood representations into the everyday moment, right? Um, and so for me, I, I think that those are some of the ways that we could begin to have a discussion about this and uh, really begin to critique what it means uh, in terms of power for one particular category of peoples to uh, represent all of us. Um, and so I would like to see where everybody th what everybody thinks about this when we get to that point in the, the discussion. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be going over more clips of this, but uh, yeah, basically any space that is majority white is intrinsically problematic. That, that's what you could take away from that, what they want to critique. They won't specifically say or can't candidly say what they're critiquing or questioning or discussing or having a conversation about. But ultimately what it is is just give us, hey, white people, give us your money. Let us take down your statues. Let us burn your shops. You know, uh, and we're, what we're going to do is pave over it and jack up the rent, bring in more immigrants to live in the high rise apartments. We're going to pave over your old 1960s family owned drugstore and we're going to open some LGBT resource center. <laughs> That's what it fucking means. It means that your country is getting less white. Your grandkids are going to be brown. 
uh, and having every movie of the past 40 fucking years portray white people as uh, dastardly villains or out of touch, clumsy oaf idiots who don't get it. That wasn't enough. Uh, apparently, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what would satiate the psychotic bloodlust of these people, but just full on white side. But anyway, um, subscribestar.com slash dirt's the worst. Throw me some bucks. And uh, if you have a video request, thanks to the illustrious DN do for throwing me so many requests. But also hit up my uh, link tree link to hit me up on new tech because YouTube is indeed asshole. But anyway, subscribe.